Welcome, everyone. It's Dr. Tofai, your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Today is another great Tuesday. We call it Hernia Talk Live. Thanks for everyone who's joining me live on Facebook as a Facebook Live and on Zoom. You also know you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. At the end of the show, this episode and all prior episodes will be hosted on my YouTube channel. So go there if you want to catch up. And if you prefer podcasts, eventually this will be up as uh, the podcast, but there's plenty of other episodes from before that are here as podcasts. So I'm super excited because we're making Hernia Talk Live history. For the first time ever, we're having two guests at one time. We have Dr. Faisal, Faisal Leilani and Dr. Nadeem Samimi, both excellent board-certified pain management specialists. They are right across the street from me at the Pain and Healing Institute in Beverly Hills. I've known them since I used to work at Cedar sinai and I've been big fans of theirs. You can follow them on Instagram at pain underscore and underscore healing. So Nadeem and Faisal, is it Faisal or Faisal? Faisal, you could say. Faisal, Faisal. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me, guys. Thank, Thank you for having us. So um, I was kind of going through a little bit of your story. Uh, was it Nadeem? Was it you that used to go to USC? Did you train at USC? We both trained. Uh, we did our fellowship. Or we did our residency in anesthesia at USC together. I think that we did were I there. We were there. Well, we were just residents and you're an attending. Well, I understand. Did you know me then? <laughs> yes, we knew you. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Okay. I left in... Um, 2008 you used to always operate in the in the new hospital we were there when they moved from the old county to the new county and i remember doing laparoscopies with you and you were training uh residents or fellows yeah yeah because we had fellows we had a fellow i was there right before that like i helped part of the transition so i left right after the transition was made i remember it was like a few months after or a year or whatever. Yeah, I think it was 2008, 2009 is when they transitioned to the new county. Yeah, which was great. I really loved my job there. I loved USC. It's a great uh, place. Yeah, yeah. And the, pathology, and then, the types of patients you see, uh, you know, you like give back. It's it's a fantastic uh, hospital. Good yeah. learning experience. Agreed. And then you both came to Cedar sinai for your fellowship? Yeah. At the so, same time. Huh? We uh, did our of our anesthesia residency together and our pain fellowship training. And you're still friends together, and you're in. And then we both got married right after. Oh, Not to each other. <laughs> <laughs> that's so amazing! You know, that's yeah. really really great. There's a handful of people that I know that were together since residency that are still practicing together, and that's a very special bond. Yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah, yes. you as anyone told you, both kind of look like each other. Oh yes, many times. We've slowly yeah. morphed into it. I'm the <laughs> one with the man bun and he has the short hair. <laughs> Excellent. And so uh, we do a different type of yoga slash, you know, he's a good, he's a yoga instructor. Uh-huh. You know, so we kind you're of the uh, you're the the works. Exactly. <laughs> a lot of easy. Uh, so the reason why I brought you on is I have a lot of questions because uh we share a lot of patients and You've been really great at, at figuring out a lot of stuff. You're, you're thinkers. So I like to I like to um, connect myself with thinkers and not just doers, because uh, that's where I think the beauty of medicine is. And um, we have a lot of people to ask about pain management stuff. So I thought that would be kind of good to bring on your your expertise. We already have questions being submitted, but I told you there are a lot of questions submitted already before. Um, before today so we'll go through that and maybe briefly talk about your specialty like what does it take to become a pain management specialist and how are you different than let's say a neurologist or a, a family medicine doctor okay so we first so to get into pain management uh there's three ways you could go into it you first either could do a uh, residency in anesthesiology um, or neurology, or is another branch called physiatry, which is uh, physical medicine and rehab. Mm -hmm. uh, what me and Dr. Samimi did is we did anesthesiology. You do three years of uh, an anesthesiology residency, and then you okay. do a year uh, fellowship in interventional pain management. 
and that's during that year you kind of uh, rotate with uh, psychiatry, uh, what is it, PM and R, um, a little bit of anesthesia as well too, so you can get, kind of get that you know comprehensive approach because dealing with chronic pain, there's more than just you know sticking a needle in someone. It's yeah. kind of like treating the patient as a whole and figure out you know all types of aspects of pain, whether it be you know anatomical, psychological, all that. And uh, I mean, there are there are pain management specialists all over the nation. Is there a pain management specialist outside the U.S. too? Is that a specialty? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, there's like a world congress of pain management doctors. Some of the bigger uh, conferences are in Europe. Oh really? Good to know. Um, and then the one thing that I've always kind of uh, not liked about pain management is I feel like they only to think all pain problems are like nerve related. So they just attack the nerve and you, you know, you see my patients, right? So they can have pain because of hernia recur. They can have pain because of the mesh, because of sutures, because of nerve injury as well. But there are other reasons for it. And, and I really like that you guys understand that. But the issue that in our society we have is um, we, we don't encourage patients to be immediately sent over to pain management because most pain doctors don't understand what hernia surgeons do or what the surgery was. And so they start with narcotics and then they go to do nerve blocks and they go to spinal stimulator. That's like the plan. And it's not even a nerve problem often, most of the time, actually. So what's your, what are your comments about that? Well, I mean, I think that we're kind of spoiled in so far as that we've known you for so long. So we have a different understanding of like, if we didn't know you, and I mean, just practicing in like Southern California or this area, you have to like understand a lot. Um, I think when a lot of times when you don't understand anything, well, what is that saying? When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. So if you know how to do nerve blocks and you can't, there's no one that you trust to send or like there's a hernia surgeon in the area. I think that we just try to help them just because it's with nerve blocks to numb everything up and then block the pain signal, <laughs> the spinal cord or peripheral nerve stimulators. I mean, it's just we're taking people out of pain with the skills that we have. But yeah, there should be more wide education is the saying yeah. that a lot of these people, I think, need to be evaluated by an abdominal wall surgeons who specifically train in abdominal wall surgery. Yeah, because like sometimes a mesh is balled up. We call that a meshoma, like a balled up mesh. There's no amount of pain medication that's going to, going to treat that. You know, mm -hmm. you just have to physically remove that. That offending mesh but i've seen people that are, are scheduled not by you guys but that are scheduled for like spinal nerve stimulators right. all they need was like the mesh removal something like that i mean i i think that we've known since you you have told us is like if we there's ever a question you know you get that abdominal wall uh, uh mri or the abdominal wall yeah. ct to see what's going on before you start sticking needles in yeah yeah, and we make that readily available. That's on my website, or it's also posted on social media. But um, we let like you can just download that protocol for anyone and just give it to your radiologist and and see if they'll they'll use it. So we have a couple questions. Um, I guess one question is like, you know, this whole issue of of chronic pain in in the surgical literature, they describe chronic pain as any pain. Uh, lasting longer than three months. What is your kind of definition of chronic pain and how you see it? So usually it's, yeah, in our definition, uh, any type of pain lasting longer than, you know, three to six months, that's usually right. a cutoff where it starts affecting their daily life. Um, it starts affecting their mood. Um, and it's a vicious cycle because it affects someone's mood. They could develop depression, mm. um, anxiety, and then you're dealing with, you know, the pain itself, but then you're also trying to fix the uh, the patient's mood, whether it be anxiety or depression. Yeah. So that it gets a little bit hard to tell. And, and that's where you come in with the kind of like that comprehensive approach where we have you as a surgeon, you have us, and then we have, if it is chronic pain, you have, you know, therapists, psychiatrists on board as well, too. So one doctor told me if you have more than nine months of chronic pain, Un, like unaddressed pain that's when you start getting this centralization issue is that still correct or what do you know? i don't know that we know like an exact time mm. 
but yeah, I, I think that even, you know, I always equate it to patients to like taking a walk on grass. If those signals are being sent enough to the brain, it's just like walking on the same part of the grass. Eventually you're going to create this, this, this pathway that is really hard for the grass to grow back in. So if oh. you have unrelenting pain for a long time, even if you fix what's underlying it, it takes a while for the grass to grow in and for that new pathway to, to disappear because your body's just used to sending pain signals all the time. Even when the offending thing is there, you're still going to get some of those pain signals. Yeah. Interesting. On that same note, there's a question. Let me uh, share a screen with you so you can see the question. Again, it's about centralization of pain. So it says, in the field, in the field of post hernia surgery pain, uh, there's mention of there's mention of peripheral nerve and central nervous system sensitization. What are your thoughts as to whether this like any additional surgery may further aggravate the sensitization. Maybe we can talk about um, CRPS first. And then I'm curious, like how we could handle those patients if they need surgery, let's say, and they're already sensitized. Because to me, I'm like, I don't touch them. And I'm a big fan of not touching nerves. Like there's a whole thing about triple neurectomy in our world. Like Patients have problems with their hernia repair and then they go to a surgeon like, oh, triple neurectomy. And I feel like, and I think we have discussed with you before, cutting nerves is not without risk. So we looked and published on our patients with neurectomy. Which are the three nerves? I know the two. Yeah, ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric, and the uh -huh. genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Uh -huh. Those are the three that can be injured directly with the inguinal hernia repair. And so what surgeons do when they come in with like what they call post ingual herniography pain, which is take out the mesh, triple neurectomy, or just triple neurectomy. Now, you know, of course that doesn't make sense if your problem is not the nerve, or if you have a perfectly good iliohypogastric nerve, why should you cut it? That's called um, uh, like selective neurectomy, which is what I do. Uh, but it takes a little bit more time to figure out what the nerve is instead of like, oh, if we cut all of it, you know, you're going to do better. But we looked at our data and we published it and we saw people who came in with nerve pain and had a neurectomy, they had a 4% risk of neuroma. And people who came in with no nerve pain but got their nerve cut anyway for another reason had zero risk of neuroma. Hmm. Um, but 4% is 4% and among that 4%, there are a handful that get this centralization. So what, what, do you, what can you teach us about centralization uh, risk whether it's surgical or nerve related, like nerve, like cutting nerves. Um, and then how do we handle those patients? If, if we think that, if we think that there is some central sensitization, right? And these patients typically have some anxiety as well. And what came first, the anxiety, the depression, or the pain, but they all seem to coexist at the same time, typically for patients who are experiencing some of these central sensitization phenomenon. So I, I think that me and Fazl uh, are typically of the thought that we try to avoid um, doing any more manipulations because a lot of times when we try to fix things, we make them worse. Yeah. Focusing on some of the other uh, ways of treating it. I think that we are huge believers in pain psychologists and using mm -hmm. the neuroplasticity that they use to try to rework some of those Sensitive, uh, the, the way you're sensing pain in your brain is important. I think the ketamine is huge, any NMDA yeah. activity. So using either IV or oral ketamine to try to lower the amount of pain, um, the pain psychology, even using a small bit of methadone can be helpful, although we try to use less methadone these days. But methadone is great for some of these sensitization just because of the NMDA activity. And then once things are a little bit more calm, then going ahead and trying to fix something afterwards tends to be, I, I think, our approach. Um, so being conservative at the beginning and uh, aggressive at the end versus starting out aggressively. Can you predict who may be higher risk for it? Uh, so for CRPS complex regional pain syndrome, and yeah. just for those of you out there, you don't want to get this. This is like the worst disease I can think of it's, from a pain standpoint, right? It's really bad. So CRPS really bad. is so, it's a great question. You, you bring what well, me and Dr. Smith have seen is patients who have a pre existing uh, either anxiety, very, very common anxiety, severe OCD, depression, 
there are, we see that there are higher risk of developing CRPS. Okay. So CRPS used to be called formerly known as uh, RSD. So it's basically yeah. where your sympathetic right. system is in overdrive. <clears throat> and you want to be very careful, you know, people getting surgery with patients with this type of condition, because any type of manipulation can actually make the the pain much worse. So and manipulation of nerves or like any surgery? Any any type of surgery. So okay. and, and that's where you want to go centrally, what Dr. Shami was saying is kind of yeah. kind of desensitize that's you know that you know that whole phenomenon where it's if you could desensitize that, you talk about plasticity. So the way you desensitize, desensitize that is with therapy, uh, ketamine. Once you have you know th that on board, then you can kind of retrain the brain. Once everything calms down, then you can go in there and fix the underlying issue. So it's mm. this calming where the nerves are just constantly being activated. So, I mean, I'm also looking at like what puts you at risk for some of this central sensitization. Um, you know, you, we typically, this is all anecdotal. I mean, I'm not totally familiar with the research off the top of my head, but typically these people are typically depressed and or anxious, right? And then there's a lot of catastrophization. I mean, that's like most United States. Needs... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just turn on the news. Yeah. It's pretty high. <laughs> it is high. And we don't blame anyone for it, you know? No, but it's, it's just like, I, most of the people that I know, um, I shouldn't say, no, I think, I would say there's a fair number of people with anxiety and or depression in our society. So, okay, so here's a question that maybe can link as well. Uh, talking about spinal cord modulation and so on. So the question presented here is, can you describe the difference between spinal cord modulation and dorsal root ganglion stimulation for treatment of post angle herniography pain? Well, what um, are those? Well, cords a little bit more broad, where they're putting these wires along the spinal cord. And the way I liken the, to explain this neuromodulation is, you know, the body is speaking to the brain and saying, hey, there's this pain signal here. But the signal doesn't always get to the brain because you're sort of yelling over the, the yelling over the signal. I, I liken it to two people sitting in a restaurant and you're trying to have a talk. And then mm -hmm. someone comes in the middle and starts yelling. You can't hear each other. So the spinal cord stimulators, I, I think, work the same way. They're sending in these, these other signals like the pulsating or the vibrating or all that stuff, which is telling the brain, pay attention to that and not to the pain. Um, you know, and the hope is that people oh, are... Oh, so it's starting more... more. Is it distracting your nervous system to something else? or is It, it is distracting it. We're not exactly. letting those signals get to the brain. Versus the dorsal root ganglion, they're going right around one single nerve root. Um, and, you know, if it's for the uh, hernia, then I'm guessing it would be an L1 or T12 or L2, which depending on where it is on the abdomen. And they are trying to um, just get one single level, but they're getting a better, um, more distraction of that nerve root as opposed to just sort of the shotgun approach, which it's is... More, it's more localized, the dorsal roots. And yeah. these inject... these And work better. The wires go into your spine or into your groin? Which spine. one? For both. For, yeah, they go because in spine. One, they're space. going into the thoracic spine where they're just blocking everything, all uh -huh. signals coming from the uh, body up. And the other one is going into a uh, neural foramen, so where the nerves are exiting, but they're all put in the spine. There is a newer form of neuromodulation called the peripheral nerve stimulators. And those are, yeah. I think, much more interesting and may work better. I mean, those, those nerves are, are so small in the groin. How do you even know that you're nearby? Say that again? Those nerves in the groin are so small. How do you know that you're nearby? And it gets harder. People who've had prior surgery, you're yeah, right. Prior it's, surgery, bit, yeah. it's it's hard to visualize because they may have been manipulated. Uh, but, you know, usually you use ultrasound. But like you're saying, it, it can be difficult. Wow. And you typically will go into uh, the triple nerve area where you were discussing earlier. Not yeah. so much into the area of pain. Uh, here's another question. They tried a nerve stimulation injection for my ingle hernia pain, but they couldn't find the proper spot to do the injection. They said I only had one layer of my abdomen and there's supposed to be three layers. So they couldn't give me an injection. Where'd my other two abdominal layers go? I had a foot of my colon removed many years ago. But I think this patient, 
I don't know. I think it, does age make a difference on how thin your your muscles are and the effectiveness it of these? Be, it sounds like they had a tap lock. Is that what they had done? The tap or yeah, but I think going through the the layers that those are the obliques, right? So Correct. that's more the obliques. Yeah, yeah, you gotta use an ultrasound for that to make sure you don't go the wrong way. Um. Uh. So okay. So with regard to the the spinal, oh, here's another question. With regards to peripheral nerve stimulator, is there any value to a TENS unit? Oh, that was going to be my question. And what about a TENS unit? T E N S. You know, it's so it's so interesting because you you think of them as the same as you're putting in this why there this like a uh, modulation where you're stimulating a TENS like thing, but TENS works in a different property. So TENS you're depolarizing the, the nerve fibers so they just can't send nerve signals for a while, but eventually they'll be repolarized and they can send. Versus the peripheral nerve stimulators, you typically need 200 hours of stimulation to actually see a noticeable benefit. And we've been seeing a lot of benefit to that because that's working more on the neuroplasticity by having these afferent messages stop being sent or distracted again, your pain, your brain starts unlearning the memory to this pain and just ignoring it for good. Mm. They seem to work pretty well. Here's a comment, which I completely believe, uh, agree with. It says, say no to triple neurectomy performed laparoscopically up high, close to the spine. Agreed. We used to do that. We called it radical neurectomy. We thought it was a good idea. Like yeah. if you can cut it in the groin, why not go all the way where it comes out of the spine? Not understanding that there's a lot of motor nerve act activity um, of those ilioingual ilio-hepagastric nerves before it hits the groin. Like um, in the flank? You guys were doing it? Yeah, laparoscopically, we're pushing, wow. pulling the colon over and going out just behind the psoas, cutting the wow. nerve there. Wow. It's a single nerve branch at that at that level. Yeah, it's a single big nerve branch, so you can see it and cut it. Around what, T, T11, T12, L1? Yeah, so you you, you find the 12th Combined. rib, and you go Correct. below it, and you find uh, L1 and um, ilioingual, sorry, iliohepagastric, ilioingual come off of it. Wow. But no, there's no book that says there's a motor function to the ilioingual or iliohepagastric nerve. It always talks about the groin. Mm -hmm. So we're like, oh, if you can't, if you fail in the groin or you don't want to go in the groin, you're in there laparoscopically, you can just cut it there. And then people start getting these adverse bulging of their lower abdomen because you're capturing it proximally where there's a lot of motor nerve function that we were never taught about. Don't do it. Um, this patient had it done. This procedure has caused denervation of the abdominal wall, resulting in bulging, which is painful, and there's no cure. That's very true. When I asked what side effects result from this procedure besides numbness, I was told there were none, but now we know that's not true. I hope it is not a practice anymore. It actually is practice, and one of the reasons why it's practice is um, the only papers on it show how, what a great procedure it is, <laughs> and no one has written a paper saying these are the pe people that are hurt from it. And I feel like I just need to write like an editorial paper because no one's studying the aftermath. Um, and the only paper that had a large enough population to show it failed to disclose the number of patients that um, had the had the denervation. Even though they had it, they just didn't put it in the paper. It's kind of kind of crazy. Um, oh, here's a. I had one done and now having problems in my lower abdomen pain all over my body. Um, okay, let's go to some more questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, here's a patient who's asking about pain management and, and, and surgical kind of approaches where it says, as a patient who had surgery, how can you tell when a patient pain management referral hides a surgical failure? Is treatment time the only aspect to consider that i get asked that a lot they're like oh i don't want the nerve block because that's just going to mask my pain i'd rather you cut the nerve but i try to explain that you know you may i mean don't nerve blocks hydrodissection steroids whatever can't those actually help you heal any nerve yeah, injury so, or yeah so sometimes um so the goal with these nerve blocks is we usually put um, a steroid. So if we could reduce if the nerve is angry and inflamed, the goal is if you get near the nerve and flood it with cortisone, you can reduce the swelling and kind of like slow down that firing. So you can help with the swelling, which 
and turn it can help with the pain. So that's what we, we can do. This doesn't necessarily mean it's already damaged. You got to go straight to surgery. Sometimes we could get this calmed down with injections. Yeah. And you know, like people always, uh, <laughs> you know, even in the back, like when you have sciatica, people think that the compression of the nerve is what's causing the pain, but it's not just a compression. It's a compressure that's causing um, the release of inflammatory mediators that are that are telling the pain signals to go out. Mm -hmm. So you know, we sometimes see patients, you know, I'll relate this to the spine, who have such bad compression, they shouldn't be able to walk or they shouldn't be able to do anything. Yet they're not in pain, so you, you don't fix it. Similarly, I'm sure in your position, you know, if you can get a nerve to calm down, it doesn't always have to be in pain. So taking drastic measures at the beginning sometimes... Yeah. A shot in the foot you just want to lower the inflammatory markers and the body can adapt i think human bodies can adapt to a lot of stuff if we let them and like we always tell our patients you, you treat the patient's clinical symptoms sometimes people are always fixated on the imaging the mri findings that's but true yeah if you could fix their clinical symptoms and they're fine that's sometimes more advantageous than having a perfect looking mri Going back to the stimulation <laughs> question, is there a risk of lead migration with dorsal lead migration? Yeah. Oh, look, leads. With dorsal root ganglion stimulation to a greater extent than for a spinal cord manipulator? That's a reasonable question. I think that it depends on whether or not they're using leads that are just the single leads that like a pain doctor can put in, or there's what's called a paddle lead that it's typically a surgeon will put in. I think the paddle leads tend to migrate much less than the single leads that are put in. And I think that the dorsal root ganglion leads tend to migrate less too, um, just because they're more stuck uh, in, in a, a smaller area. Um, so when they the spinal, migrate, they just move to a different part of the nerve? Correct. They or just will move, even like small millimeters or like a half centimeter movement of it being pulled back just will cause a, um, a huge difference in the stimulation. And the coverage might be lost too. So that's one of the things sometimes if you get lead migration, you might not get that same adequate pain coverage. And what is it when they say they do a trial? Like, oh, well, I had a trial and it worked or it didn't work. What does that mean? Just where do you put the, the leads? So when you're doing a spinal cord stimulator, <clears throat> what you do is you, you don't implant it permanently. You basically uh, implant the leads um, um, through the epidural space, you have uh, a rep, you wake up the patient and you test sure. and you see if uh, the coverage of where their pain is, is being covered with a stimulation. If they, they say yes, then they basically, you adhesive, put adhesives on, tape it up and you try it on for a week. If a patient says, Hey, you know what? I know it's a big difference. My pain is 70% better. Then you could do the, the surgical implants, which is permanent. Wow. Okay, cool. Um, does anchoring the dorsal root ganglion lead also become a potential source of pain? I don't even know where these questions come from. Wow. I mean, <laughs> a lot of questions. Possibly. I'm, I'm not heard that be a big problem, but I, I, it's certainly possible. Wow. Um, okay, let's go to some easier questions. <laughs> Uh, can you minimize the side effects of different pain management options, such as uh, gastric lesions for NSAIDs or dizziness and nausea for opioids? I mean, we're, we we uh, uh, very much are anti-opiate, so sometimes the side effects, are, we're not looking to do them, stop them, just because... Yeah. Most people should not be on chronic <laughs> opiates. Like, unless you're going to be dying in six months to a year, like long term opiate use typically always causes increase in pain. Like, I, I can say Milani. Really? Never, yeah, I've never seen a patient. That's the paradoxical, who, that's the paradoxical effect of opioids, right? Yes. I mean, if you think about it, you're, whenever your body sees something it likes or it doesn't like, it just as a receptor, it's going to build more yeah. receptors. So if you're putting opiates into you, your body's going to build more opiate receptors. <laughs> and over time, that's just going to be sending more pain signals. Like I never how long does it take for that to happen? Sorry. I think it's vastly like different for some months people. or years? We could see it after a I week. Six months. Or, yeah. Wow. 
it's it's interesting when uh, me and uh, Nadeev worked at Cedars, we used to see a lot of patients with chronic abdominal pain. And as you know, these are some of the toughest patients uh, to treat. And many of the times- They all have hernias, but okay. Yeah, these patients get placed on high dose opioids. Yeah. And it, like Dr. Samim was saying, it kind of does the reverse. Um, you know, it causes slowing and sludging of the bowels. Um, it could cause a thing that's called opioid bowel syndrome, where you get the reverse, that paradoxical effect of being on chronic opioids, where you're in more pain, even though you're taking these opioids. So it gets very, very uh, tricky. Now, patient who has a surgery acutely, yeah, for a week to two weeks. But after that, that's when you run into more problems, unfortunately. There's these crazy studies that they show that people who have had surgery and exposed to zero opiates afterwards have something yeah. like 95 less percent chance of developing any chronic pain syndromes from said surgery. So like if you talk to most pain doctors, I, I think that all of us would avoid opiates unless like they were forced upon us for the most part, like dealing with the pain in the short term is much more worth it. But yes, I mean, there's a stuff that's obvious like Zofran and for the NSAIDs, right? One of the biggest like generic, one of the biggest like uh, drugs when we first started was combining ibuprofen and uh, what was it, Fazl? The Hodidine? Famididine. Famididine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think they say it's like 80% less gastric ulcers, but even long-term NSAID use is dangerous. The only one that seems to be um, guilt-free is taking Tylenol every day. Yeah. I mean, they have the Cel Celebrex, which works on COX-2, which can help with, you know, apparently it could reduce some of the gastric, inf you know, inflammation Ooh. with the NSAIDs. And Celebrex just as good as NSAIDs for their, anti it's anti-inflammatory? Yeah. 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 Okay. No. Here's a question. So being placed on phycetone or methadone by the pain clinic is a is not a recommendation from you all? That's a if question. you have to be on chronic opiates, uh, methadone seems to be the, methadone or buprenorphine seem to be the best long-term just because people only need to go up on the methadone dose typically once or twice versus like traditional short-acting opiates, you're just going up on the dose, you know, every several months or for some people, or they need a higher dose, but they don't get it. But methadone, it, it's just hard in the environment now where all the doctors are being asked to not prescribe or there's so many hoops. Yeah. But like I had a long-term problem, I probably would be on methadone just because of and how long you, it's in the system. When I was a resident, we were taught you can't be taken off methadone. Is that false? Oh yeah, we've taken a lot of people off. It's challenging. It takes it's a long time. Yeah, it's a long um, half-life. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Here's it's a, a question it's about like fifty hour half life. Pregabalin. So I guess gabapentin, pregabalin, those those kind of like nerve I call them nerve modulators. I don't know if that's the right kind of yeah, late. Right? Yeah. Um do you think pregabalin at 250 milligrams per day is an adequate treatment for post hernia surgery pain, or is it similar to paradoxical opioid effect you just described? So no, I have a I question know. about that. Huh? Yeah, I've never heard of Lyrica or pregabalin causing <laughs> increased pain over time. It's not something you get uh, oh, okay. to like the opiates. So there's a trend to use uh, gabapentin, Lyrica, those kind of neurontin, those kind of medications for like pain around the time of surgery. Um, can it be used instead of, or it's just to reduce how much opioids or NSAIDs you may need? Yeah. I I think it's great to use it and try to minimize the amount of opiates using that with mm. some NSAIDs and Tylenol and Tylenol, absolutes. In in Europe, they do more Tylenol with the gabinoids, and people have done well. And is that an appropriate dose for like a 70 year old? 250 is a lot. Yeah. So if they're naive, no one should be started. Normally the naive patients are started like 75 milligrams twice a day or three times. Oh, a that time. is very light. Yeah. And if they're older, then even lower. Sometimes Does it causes a time. lot of is it because it has organ damage or it causes a lot of um it causes more sedation and 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 yeah. yeah. It, so in my get... experience, I think with with Lyrica, around 150 to 200, and then when you get higher, you get more side effects. And I don't see it as beneficial. What do you think, Dr. Swelling, too. Yeah. That's like the one swelling. that limits a lot of it. Mm. 
Um, what are the most promising innovative therapies that have shown increased effectiveness and fewer side effects when compared to traditional therapies? What do you guys like? Medications or procedures? Um, you know, let's start with medications and then we'll ask for like the newer procedures. Uh, I think ketamine is a very, very interesting medication. Yeah. You're hearing a lot about ketamine. I think now maybe because of uh, the abuse with some maybe celebrities uh, took, you know, took it, but ketamine works on like, I think uh, my partner was saying, works on NMDA, which is responsible for nerve pain. It also works on serotonin, norepinephrine, which are also responsible for nerve pain. And uh, interesting enough, it's responsible for patient's mood. People with chronic pain do have lower levels of serotonin and norepinephrine. Ketamine mm. can actually help increase the reuptake of that. And so, you know, that okay. adjunct with, you know, therapy, I think that can be a, a, a promising uh, a therapy for nerve Yeah. Pain. And what about procedures? What are some newer procedures you guys are liking? Well, well one more thing about medicines. I, and you're, you're, the people listening to this have probably heard of it. But we've been using or trying to use more and more low dose naltrexone. You you've heard of this? Oh, low dose naltrexone. There's a question on mushrooms coming up too. On mushrooms? Yeah. Oh, on psychedelics. Yeah, microdosing. Yeah, there's a shaman, right? I think I, I I may have spoke to. I think you got me. Yes, I had to speak to our shaman. Yeah. <laughs> So this low dose uh, naltrexone, though, for people who have like pain, especially I think you mentioned someone had a question about all over body pain. I, we yeah. I think that we find this to be one of the the best treatments, but then it doesn't get publicized and it's it's not new because there's no um, drug marketing since it's a generic drug and has to be compounded for oh, people. But the yeah. low dose naltrexone, like just all it does is block the opiate receptor, and we think the way it works is by telling the brain to make more endorphins because you don't think you have enough, which you're just increasing your overall opiates in your body. So you're self-treating your own pain. Wasn't naltrexone used for people to like not withdraw from opioids? Wasn't that the No, original? it was used to reverse opiates. So naloxone reverse. is like yeah. the IV form and naltrexone is an oral form of the same medicine. Oh, but it can also be used for pain? Yes, and they're actually used for alcoholism at higher doses too. To seems to block some of the um, desires for addictive behaviors. That's so interesting. And then, could eating be an addictive behavior? Could this be the new weight loss medication? Maybe <laughs> after Ozempic. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Oh man! If I had a nickel for every time someone discusses Ozempic, or like <laughs> like it's for every day. I mean, they're all on it. That's why everyone's on it. Everyone in LA. But but um, to speak to the innovative yeah. procedures, I, yeah. I think that this peripheral nerve stimulator has been is becoming. I, I hate this term. The little bit of a game changer. Mm -hmm. Like before, there was all these like pains that we couldn't do anything about, and using yeah. these peripheral nerve stimulators, which are only temporarily put in the muscles near nerves in your body, like people get 70 80 percent pain relief, which is unheard of in our field. For long periods, even with from like peripheral nerve back stimulation, yeah, from these peripheral nerve stimulation. Let me ask you this: a real complication, yeah. yeah. So, if you have someone who benefits from a peripheral nerve stimulator, does that mean surgical neurectomy or nerve ablation should also treat that as a cure? Not Possibly, necessarily, but I—that's my question for you. When you do these neurectomies, like you're left with some paresthesias afterwards and some people are bothered as much by the paresthesias no I, yeah I they get numbness. <laughs> some of them get paresthesias mostly they get numbness but a, a good four percent get neuromas and need more or have need more um injections and stuff because yeah it's a problem like i think the, the other thing that we've seen are like uh doing neurectomies with phenol or hydrodissection with phenol, which kills the nerve endings in the alcohol. Area. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Alcohol based ablations. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. What do you think of that? I, I've seen it work pretty well. I mean, mm. I think you're the ultimate. Uh, yeah. I, I've seen both. I've seen it be effective. Sometimes it doesn't do anything, unfortunately. So, you know, we, in, in doing our paper on neurectomy, we're like, okay, maybe we should be doing ablation. Is ablation less injurious to the nerve than surgical neurectomy? 
there's no papers out there that I could find that talks about the risk of neuroma after an ablation. A non-surgical ablation. Non-surgical ablation. Like I mean, we know that it exists, right? Because it was a phenol was being used, alcohol was being used a lot for the intercostal nerves, and they, you know, uh -huh. some percentage of them still develop neuromas afterwards. So after the alcohol wears off, like six months yeah. later, they can be left with more pain. Yeah. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, should we talk about CBD and THC? Sure. I'm a big fan of CBD because I think it's a great uh, anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not as knowledgeable as to how much... T I've, I've been told you need a little bit of THC, less than five milligrams, to augment the CBD, but I'm not sure that's true. Uh, it it depends how much, because the problem with THC is, like you were saying, if if you take too much, you get dizzy. Uh, you'll probably eat a lot more food. Um, so it's, yeah, I usually tell patients, you know, around like 2.5 milligrams. Um, you do need a little bit with the CBD. The CBD works more with the inflammation. I think the THC works more centrally. <clears throat> so that's why people see like more of a benefit. Mm -hmm. I typically tell people to try the CBD first. If it didn't work, they can try it with some THC because everyone's so different. True. True. And the dosing. So the lower doses, like 10, 10 milligrams, like it's starting for CBD, but then I think I have my patients sometimes 40 or 60 milligrams if they need like more. I like the anti-inflammatory aspect of CBD. Do you guys Correct. think that's a good thing? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And starting at a low dose and working your way up is a lot safer than vice versa. So you just go up and see how much you can tolerate. Okay. Yeah. Um, here's a question. How do you actually use these peripheral nerve stimulators to address post herniorphia pain? When and where and how are the stimulators placed? We kind of discussed that already. Oh. So kind of like But in the lower abdomen. L1, L2, yeah. Okay. They don't do it in the back. For this kind of stuff, it'd be done more in the abdominal wall. Oh, for the peripheral nerves. And then where's the little battery or whatever? You stick it on the skin, the nerve, the, the wires come out of the skin and you cover it. You change the dressing every two days. There's uh -huh. a, a battery you can disconnect to go into the shower and you just reconnect it afterwards. And you have a little remote control wow. to control the stimulation. And it doesn't get infected? No. No, because it, it's a coiled uh, product when uh, within a few days, the skin like uh, 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 grows into the coil and it's pretty good protection from oh, like the central line. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. Uh, do you have patients that take tapentadol long-term without increases in pain? I have a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve nerve injury, but I can't use a stimulator due to foreign body responses. I can't have anything implanted. This is true. She's reacted to everything that's ever been implanted in her. What is tapentadol? Nucinta? It's yeah. like uh, the newer form of tramadol. Yeah. It's a little bit stronger than the tramadol. Yeah, okay, but so does it have nerve thing. properties? Yeah, it works on norepinephrine and um, what is the serotonin? serotonin? So you do have a little bit of nerve. Um, but it's an um, opioid. Yes. It works partial on opioid, opioid, partial centrally acting, and partial uh -huh. like opiate agonist ag acting. Okay, very interesting. Um. Okay, <laughs> here's another question. It says, is some degree of chronic pain expected after multiple surgeries? On a scale of one to 10, what do you think is the maximum amount of pain that complex patients should treat conservatively before investigating the need for further surgery? That's a hard That's question. A pretty loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> That's all subjective. Everyone's different, right? Yeah. Everyone's different. We yeah. have some patients who've undergone like 15 surgeries and they're playing basketball, walking, doing everything. We have patients who have three surgeries, but unfortunately they're almost bedridden. They're in so much pain. Mm. So it's. I think for a person like that, if there's really a question, I think having a few sessions with a, a pain psychologist to. Yeah to really explore like what their expectations are and like help set things. Even though people all think it's, oh, just mumbo jumbo. It's, it's so effective. Pain psychology. Can you talk about hydrodissection and what that is? 
That's the only time. So yeah, hydrosection is basically dissecting a nerve using water. So imagine like a water pick, which, which you use to clean your teeth. There's some thought where you could dissect the nerve. There's some scar tissue around. Um, I don't do too much hydrosection. I know there's some 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 uh, colleagues who do do it and they swear by Yeah. it, but it's that's what it's using like a high frequency I've seen water. some amazing, Yeah, amazing improvement with that. and you could like it's it's fairly safe, um, you know. We've been trying to start a protocol where we do hydrodissection with PRP. So as to not give them steroids, but at least have some anti-inflammatory in Yeah. there and seeing if that will last longer. And hopefully we can expand that. And what, can you explain what PRP is and how it works? PRP is where we take your blood, we take out the red blood cells, the white blood cells, you're left with some growth factors, some platelets, and we use that as your uh, as a natural anti-inflammatory to sort of treat your own pain. I, I mean, I always tell people, it's like, if you get hurt, your blood has a lot of this stuff it needs to fix you, right? Mm, That's why you yeah. blood. So if we can hijack that process by taking out some of the stuff that causes more pain and putting that there and trying to encourage the body to heal itself. And uh, is there a risk to doing PRP besides It's fairly the other? safe because it's used, like he was saying, it's using your body, it's using your plasma to start the whole healing process. I mean, So, these NBA players are all getting injections of oh, that, yeah. right? You don't have to worry because, unfortunately, with steroids, sometimes, sometimes you know, you do more harm than good. So it's it's much safer because the this, I guess the worst thing that can happen is it won't work, you know, but you don't Mm have -hmm. the I see. side effects of all like the medications like the steroids. And how Yeah, is we that feel different it's so than much stem safer. cells? Okay. How's that different than stem cells? So stem cells are using cells that we think are pluripotent or can change into something else. PRP, we're not looking to change those cells into something else. We're just trying to treat your own inflammation and maybe encourage local healing versus stem cells that are hoping that they give you a cell either where it comes from the fat or the bone marrow or placental tissue. Or there's, I don't think there's an agreed upon definition on how it's being used in regenerative medicine and everyone does their own way. But you're hoping that this cell, say, you know, you're injected into your knee is going to turn into like a meniscus cell. So you're rebuilding your meniscus. For some like PRP, you're just hoping for less inflammation and pain mediators being released. Does injecting PRP also like heal? So we talked about sports hernias before we started the show and uh, the question was like, what is a sports hernia? So there are like four different reasons why you can get a sports hernia. One is you have a rectus tear off your bone. The other one, it could be a partial tear. The other one is you get an adductor tendon tear off your pubic bone. Third is you can have an actual fascial tear of the external oblique. Um, so the rectus tear, I think, uh, was it Nadal? The, Correct. you had Nadal. that? Yeah. And then uh, the right, the adductor tear is like LeBron injury. Um, you got a fascial tear, which is number three, which is the external oblique epineural, so you can just tear it kind of like a fabric. Um, you can have uh, that tear plus a nerve underneath it, where now you have a little slit in the fascia, a little nerve underneath it. So every time you engage or you cause abdominal pressure, you're pushing the nerve in, so it causes neuralgia. That's the fourth way. And the fifth one is there's so much injury um, with scar tissue that then now entraps nerves. So those are all sport hernias, none of which are really hernias. Um, So you don't operate on that yourself, do huh? you? Do you operate on that? They're off. I get referred to them. They're almost always non-operative. Um, and what they really need are injections and, uh, well, rest, rest, sometimes uh, steroids, anti-inflammatories, and then injections. So usually we do local with steroids first, and then we graduate to PRP. The professional athletes, they go straight to PRP. They don't even wait for the rest part as much. Um, but my thought is that you inject PRP with the goal of healing the tears and healing right Correct. So yeah imagine like when you fall, right? And you yeah get like a, a scar. So it basically tells the body, listen, there's an injury. Let's start the whole healing process. So it tells all your body to, you know, the fire blast, everything comes in there and starts the whole healing. So it signals the body um, that there's an injury, there's pain, and it, it basically starts the whole healing process.
Got it. You know, there's some... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. There's some of these before and after pictures where the MRI shows improvement with the stem cells. There's less of those that you see with the the PRP, but I don't think it's been systematically studied. I think for financial Mm -hmm. reasons, like there's no one place that's doing it all the same way. So people are calling PRP, but doing it differently. So there isn't a standard Mm -hmm. eyes way of doing it yet. Oh, okay. Um, follow-up question. PRP has been described to cause bony calcifications. Have you heard of this? Mm. I mean, you can get weird things that happen to anything that you reject, but it's yeah, definitely not, not a common thing. Very yeah. Wrong. Someone wrote, I tried ozone IV and it was taxing. I feel, what is ozone IV? Oh, man. <laughs> is that one of those? It's very controversial. Yeah. The guy who promotes it the most claims that he can solve any disease with it. Um, and so there's some data that proves that it works. You can inject it into your knee. Some people take your blood out, ozonate it, and then re-inject it into yourself. Oh. The studies, are, I think- Is that are, like hydro, is that like oxygenated water? <laughs> you heard that? Does. Yes. Yeah, that in the hydrogen water. <laughs> hydrogen water, or hydrogen water, there's oxygen water, hydrogen water. I don't know. Uh, I haven't been, I haven't found, there is some like good evidence, especially for joint injections with ozone, but I haven't seen any good evidence for anything else. Uh, Here's another comment. This is such an excellent discussion. Do you three doctors think you can accurately distinguish somatic pain from neuropathic pain? I don't know that there is anyone who can do that a hundred percent. Yeah. My concern is that so many surgeons think all post-op pain is neuropathic pain. No. Which is actually the direct opposite. Most are not, but you know. Yeah, you see the nerve type pains come later on, not early. Yeah. Yeah. Unless they directly injured it. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. I have a pretty good pain response to my groin post-op surgery pain to topical lidocaine. Unfortunately, my mild tinnitus is aggravated by by this and becomes intolerable. Oh, lidocaine and tinnitus? It, it can cause that. Some people when it gets into the blood. Sensitive. High doses of lidocaine oh, can cause tinnitus. I didn't know that. Um, is there any strategy to get around this issue? It requires a substantial amount of topical lidocaine to apply. Can you do anything about that? No, I guess not. Just kind of lower I mean, you could try a different anesthetic. So some people will compound bupivacaine or you could try some of the Emla cream. I think that they're not going to get as uh, much absorption. So instead of lidocaine, you use bupivacaine, um, which you have to get from the pharmacy. There's no um, over-the-counter. Right. Take a compound All the rest of them you have to get from a doctor. So talking to a compound pharmacist and they may be able uh-huh. to hook you up with a local doctor that will write for you. Got it. And then Emla cream. Emla... Yeah, amyl cream, which is another type of topical. Yeah, I think it's prilocaine. I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question about CBD, but we you missed it. We already talked about CBD. We support um, it. Huh? We support it. The CBD. Yeah, yeah. I think CBD has been a great addition for a lot of people with pain issues. Uh, next question: Is it possible to reject mesh with just signs of high inflammation levels, and then going around organs, heart, and lungs? I had mine removed and no issues since two years. So I'll answer that. In terms of mesh is an inflammatory implant. So we're starting to see more of what we call mesh implant illness, which is an autoimmune or inflammatory response to to meshes. But there is a growing risk of implant-related reactions, whether it's a hip implant or spinal implant or breast implant, dental implant. So um, mostly the Western world too. So I think they're doing something with these implants that's that's not good for you. I'm curious, is there any like um, drive towards testing people for allergies before implanting? Like do you send people- Good question. So not yet. Um, I do that. Oh man. Uh, Mostly because I'm trying to learn from it so we published our paper on mesh implant illness, which are people that we feel were doing fine and they got an implant, specifically the mesh, and then now they're like 
disabled for whatever reason. They're like a brain fog, hair loss, tinnitus, ear, uh, visual changes. They get weird skin rashes, joint pain, tingling in their fingers and toes, um, concentration problems, sleeping problems. And then they take out their mesh and then they're back to normal again. So it's not common. Um, we're studying it to see like what is the most likely that are like risk factors for it. It seems to be female gender is one, or female sex is one, and then um, a personal or family history of autoimmune disorders seems to oh. increase your risk of that. So now my practice has changed because of that experience, because I have the highest experience in the world for this now. Um, I do not, I choose not to put meshes in people if I can, who like already come to me with like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or certain certain things or or if they've had their breast implants removed for breast implant illness. Um, this is a crazy and, question. Can you make a yeah. biological mesh out of someone's body tissue of some sort? Well, before there was mesh, they were taking the tensor fascia lata, yeah, using that as mesh. But that's I mean, a big operation. It's a big thigh incision, take off the tensor fascia lata, and then use that for the abdominal wall. So they, yeah, they were doing that. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, <laughs> it recurs everything recurs it's biologic so whether it's now we have synthetic no, we have synthetic biologics which are absorbable and we have cadaver biologics which are also absorbable none of that have, have been shown to work effectively permanently um but there are certain times when we use it and then uh what i do is in the patients that i either think may have mesh implant illness or at risk for it and I don't know what I can use. Like, can I use polypropylene? Can I use a su certain sutures or what? I've partnered up with the allergist to do the allergy testing. And to date, so I give them, I give them samples of mesh, samples of sutures, and I said, test these on the patient. To date, what we've noticed is it's if it's positive, it's helpful, but it's about a 40% false negative rate. Hmm. So it's not considered standard right now to do that. But maybe at some point we'll be able to have, and, and their blood tests are almost always normal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's possible, but it's not. There's no standard yet. We're still in the learning. If you have someone who comes to you with chronic abdominal pain, you suspect that there's you know a small hernia. You get imaging, but don't see anything. Would yeah. you ever still operate if your clinical suspicions are high enough? Unlikely, but. I read my own imaging because the majority of those negative CTs or MRIs are are not negative. And you heard Valsalva, huh? You yeah. heard Valsalva with them? Yeah, CT with Valsalva. You can do MRI with Valsalva, and then the ultrasound should always be with Valsalva. Hmm. Yeah, it'll, it'll show them it. like belly button hernias often don't present with hernia at the belly button; it's to the left or to the right of it. So people mm. are looking to the left or right, looking for the problem, but the problem is at the belly button. You fix the belly button hernia and that pain to the side goes away. Can we ask yeah. you some questions or are we done? Yeah, no, we got one more minute. <laughs> Can you tell um, us about acnes? Yeah, acne. That, I have a question. Oh, yeah. I just saw. I wanted to see your, what are you thinking? Sure. So acnes is an acronym. It stands for anterior cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome. These are intercostal nerves that come down and um, right around the uh, junction of like the lateral border of your rectus muscles, the nerve split and the posterior nerve also splits again. So where these two areas split either at along the semilunar line, which is a outer border of the rectus muscle or where the posterior one splits to go anteriorly. So it's kind of kind of mid rectus. If they have point tenderness, not tenderness, point pain, one specific area and it's always with muscle engagement where it kinks the nerve every time <clears throat> they they um use their muscles so usually sitting up from bed twisting to get grab a bag from like the back seat um coughing then that may be acnes and what you do is you take a um, ultrasound and you block the nerve right before it splits do you see it on ultrasound? No, it's like a tap block. Okay. Got it. So you, you basically go <clears throat> between uh, the like layers. tap block right just laterally. You grab that 
Um, and you can also go at the, if it's more of a rectus muscle area, you take your ultrasound, you, know, you do an anterior rectus and posterior rectus block. So between the fascia layers, that's where the nerve runs uh, below and above the, the, and see if their pain goes away. And we actually had a good experience with that. We published our results on that. So we found half the patients only need nerve blocks between hmm. three, three to five nerve blocks every two weeks. And the other half needs surgical neurectomy because they get better, but they never really get cured. That's the patient I had is he's had multiple blocks. He would do well for a week and the pain will come right back. Unfortunately. Oh, well, that's good. That means he'll do well with surgical neurectomy. So yeah. And we cut and the nerve right before uh, it hits, it splits. Got it. And it's typically one of them. There's not more <laughs> that occur. You know, it's uncommon, but I've had patients with multiple ones. I've had maybe three or four of them on either side, up and down, you know, and it happens and they get cured when you fix it. So it's a, it's a very satisfying little procedure to do for these patients. All right. I think uh, we're done. We have a lot more questions, but we're going to have to call it a night. Thanks, guys. Thanks for well, joining dude, this me. Was, this was a, a lot of fun. Happy to do it again soon if you ever want to save some of those questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And to all of you who were gracious enough to bring in live questions tonight and also before, I really appreciate you. A lot of, a, a lot of questions tonight. Thanks, Dr. Samimi and Dr. Leilani. We love you. You've been so great to my patients. You really have. There's a handful of patients that were very, very difficult, and you cured them. So I'm very, I, I'll never forget that. And that's it for Honey Talk Live. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. And I'll see you again next week with another great uh, episode. We're here every week, Honey Talk Tuesdays. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel to catch up on all the episodes and learn more and share. And if you prefer the podcast, you can go to Hernie Talk Live as a podcast wherever podcasts are listened to. See you all next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.